Now that we have a few concrete examples of our area process, let's summarize and state some general results. Now, start with a function f. We'll assume it's continuous in the closed interval a, b. For now, we'll assume our function f is greater than or equal to zero on the interval. That just means the graph of our function is above the x-axis. We want to approximate the area of this region here. So below the graph of f, above the x-axis, chopped off at a and b. We'll do that by filling the region in with rectangles. So to get our rectangles, we're going to take our interval, chop it up into n subintervals of equal length, then we're to pick a point in each subinterval, apply our function f. So each subinterval gives us the base of the rectangle. When I apply the function f to a point in the subinterval, that's going to give us the height. Now we can arrange it so that all of our heights give us rectangles that live under the graph of f. In that case, we'll call them inscribed rectangles. And then we take the sum of the area of each rectangle. We'll call that a lower sum. Similarly, we can arrange it so that the rectangles are on the outside of the graph, in which case we call them circumscribed rectangles. Then our approximation is called an upper sum. Now, I want to let the number of rectangles that we're using n go off to infinity. So that's going to guarantee that the length of each base goes down to zero. If the limit exists, then, okay, in the case of our lower sums, we'll call that the lower limit. In case of the upper sums, we'll call it the upper limit. Now, a big result, if we have the situation here, where f is greater than or equal to zero, we're continuous on the interval, then we'll have the L is equal to u, and then I take that as the definition of area. Now, one consequence of this result is going to be that it won't matter what point you use in each subinterval to get your height. So you don't have to use endpoints, you could use any point that's in the interval that makes things convenient. Next, we want to generalize our process to handle negative values of f. So I want to keep the same exact definition, okay, same process, I'm just going to push it through when we have negative f. So what happens here? The thing to focus on is going to be the definition of the area of the rectangle. So we had f on xi times delta x. Now, if I'm at a point where f of xi is negative, what happens in the picture? Where before we had rectangles that were above the x-axis, since f is negative, the rectangle is now going to be pointing down. So it'll be below the x-axis. So if you note, though, the area is going to be the same. It's still base times height, just that it's picking up a minus sign. So if you track down what's happening in the definition, if the graph of f was completely below the x-axis, the process is still going to give you area except with a minus sign. So if we consider a function that has both negative and positive values, what comes out of the process is a net area. So the idea would be we take all the areas for parts of the function above the x-axis, subtract off all the areas for parts of the function below the x-axis. So for instance, we have this region here going from minus 1 to 2. Okay, we're going to go for the region bounded between the function f of x equals x and the x-axis. So it's going to give me two triangles. The area of the triangle from minus 1 to 0 is going to have area a half, but we put it through the process that picks up a minus sign. So I'll have a minus a half. Then for the area of this triangle, it's area as usual, so I get a 2. So if we put this whole thing through our area process, we're going to get three halves. So that's the net area. Now, instead of calling this area, which is really bad, okay, let's give it another name. So the definition is going to be, recall this net area, the definite integral of f over the interval a, b. And the way we write that, okay, so it's going to look like an indefinite integral, except we're going to have numbers on the integration sign. So we still have f of x as your integrand. You have the dx that tells you that you're integrating with respect to x. Now we have limits of integration. 
So this is going to be the lower limit of integration. This is going to be the upper limit of integration. All right. Now, we could generalize one more step. You get rid of continuous f. Then we would need the condition to be f is integrable, which is just going to mean the limits make sense. But then you're going to need a whole lot more conditions to state something reasonable. So that's for a higher math class. So how do we calculate these definite integrals? We have three options. First, you have the limit process. So it's just going through the definition using the rectangles. It's a lot of bookkeeping, and it can be time consuming. Next, if you sketch the picture that goes with your definite integral, and you get lucky, meaning outcomes of familiar shape, like a circle or rectangles, you take areas, and then you just have to worry about being above or below the x-axis. Last option, which we don't have yet, but we will soon, first fundamental theorem of calculus. That's going to give us a connection between definite integrals and indefinite integrals. So the notation and the naming here is no accident. We'll see that these things have everything to do with each other. OK, now if you think about it, OK, at this point, no reason to expect area to have anything to do with an antiderivative, but it's there. OK, we don't have that yet, so let's see what we can do. First example, we're going to take the definite integral from minus 1 to 1 of function 2 plus x with respect to x. I sketch the function, so it's going to be a straight line, slope 1, intercept at 2. We're going to integrate over the interval from minus 1 to 1. So you'll note our function is positive over our region, so I'm looking at an actual area here. So to calculate this definite integral, I just take the area area of a trapezoid, it's going to be 1 half the sum of the heights times the length of the base. So this definite integral is going to be equal to 4. Next example, do the definite integral from minus 2 to 2, minus square root of 4 minus x squared with respect to x. Now here, if we let y be equal to our function, square both, we'll have x squared plus y squared equals 4. So the curve is going to be a circle centered at the origin of radius 2. Square root only returns positive values, but we're putting a minus sign in front of it, so I only keep the part that's below the x-axis. So we're going to have this half of the circle. Now, since it's below the x-axis, we're just going to compute the area and then tack on a minus sign. So we're going to have 1 half pi 2 squared times a minus 1 so we're going to wind up getting a minus 2 pi. So definite integral here is equal to minus 2 pi. Before we look at more examples, let's list some general rules for definite integrals. The first set are going to deal with the limits of integration. Now, first rule, take a definite integral from a to a of f of x with respect to x, I get 0. Now, here we don't have a proper interval. We're just over the point A. So our picture looks like this. And you'll note our region is just a line segment. So the area there is going to be equal to 0. Another way to think of it, if you run it through our limit process with the rectangles, delta x is always going to be equal to 0 since A minus A is 0. There's no width here. OK. Second rule, I take this as a definition. So if I take the definite integral from b to a, that's going to be equal to minus the definite integral from a to b. So in our definition, okay, we had an interval from a to b, so a was less than b. So we're allowed to find a definite integral if we have the upper limit smaller than the lower limit. So that just says if you want to define that, you define it as your usual a going to b, just introduce a minus sign. Now, that'll be useful later on. Third rule, this rule just says, well, if you want, if you have your interval a, b, you want to split up your interval, then you get the same area for the whole region if you split up into two different regions and then add their areas together. Okay, one thing about this rule here, 
Okay, the C doesn't actually have to be in your interval, just has to be somewhere where each of these terms makes sense. So those are going to be the rules for dealing with the limits of integration. Now, we also have rules which are going to be based on what we can do with the functions. So, the first rule here is we take our function, okay, we do our definite integral, multiply our function by a constant. It's going to be the same as if you do the definite integral and then save the constant for later. Now, if you think in terms of area, why is this true? Well, if I multiply by a constant, what's going to happen? Multiplying f of x by our constant, f of x represents the y value. So we're multiplying in the y direction by that constant. So we're leaving the x direction has the same scale. We're rescaling the y direction by a factor of c. So that changes the area by that same factor of c. Now the catch here is we can allow c to be negative. So it just means, okay, if you want to work it out before or after, the flip through the x-axis is going to be consistent. Next rule, if I have two functions where our definite integral makes sense separately, well, we could just break up the sum. So if you think in terms of rectangles here, this is just going to be stacking boxes. If I take the area between a and b of our function f, add it to our area between a and b of our function g, what's going to happen? Well, the idea here is you're just putting one on top of the other. So if I take this area, add it to this area, it's going to be the same as if we put them like that. Next example, let's work with our rules for manipulating the limits of integration. So we'll have definite integral going from minus 2 to 1 equal to 4, going from minus 2 to minus 4 equal to 2, and I want to find going from minus 4 to 1. So here, the function's not changing. Now the interval that we're interested in is going from minus 4 to 1, so I'll write that down. Okay, and note, it's going from small number to larger number, so we don't have to introduce the minus sign when we draw the picture. Then you'll note, we have our break at minus 2. So I'll put that in our interval. And now I want to get these with the limits in the correct order. So note what we're going to do first. First, I'm going to split our definite integral into two definite integrals, going from minus 4 to minus 2, and then going from minus 2 to 1. We'll note, we're given the definite integral going from minus 2 to minus 4. So it's going from the larger number to the smaller number. So I'm going to flip that, but to do that, I have to introduce a minus sign. Now, we have things as they're given. So that's going to be equal to a minus 2 plus a 4. So we're going to wind up getting a 2. Next example, let's use our rules for pulling apart functions. So I'm just going to use the example we had up before. We take the definite integral from minus 1 to 1, 2 plus x, with respect to x. So we saw before by drawing the trapezoid, the answer here is going to be equal to 4, and that's also going to be equal to the area since our function's above the x-axis, okay, the graph. Now, we could pull this apart. I could write that as two definite integrals. So first we'll have the function 2, then I'll have the function x. If we draw the graph for the function 2, that's just going to be a constant function at height 2. So this is just going to be the area of a square with base 2, height 2, area is going to be equal to 4. If we do the definite integral from minus 1 to 1 of x, so we draw our function, okay, the graph for x, you'll note when we take the area from minus 1 to 1, the net area is going to be 0, because this piece here has the same area as the piece below, but the piece below picks up a minus sign. So, 4 is equal to 4 plus 0, that checks out. Finally, let's go to definite integral from one of our earlier videos. So, here we were figuring out, okay, we were looking for an area, but we'll call it a definite integral now. I'm going to go from 1 to 3 of x minus 1 squared minus 1 dx. Okay, the answer that came out there when we worked out the limit process was a 2 thirds. Now, what can we do here? First, I'll expand this. So we get x squared minus 2x plus 1, and then we have a minus 1, so the 1's go away. 
Then I'm gonna pull this apart. So first, we'll split this into two definite integrals, and then I'm gonna pull out the minus two. Now for this first one, we don't have a method for getting this yet unless we go through the limit process. So if you can hold on, we'll see that that's gonna be equal to 26 over three. Then over here, what do we have? We have a minus two. Then if I draw the picture for this, what do we have? I'm gonna draw the function f of x equal to x. So it's gonna be the straight line through the origin. Okay, 45 degree angle. Then we're gonna look at the region above the interval going from one to three. So again, we have a trapezoid. Okay, and we work out its area, we're gonna get a four. So for the area of this region here, okay, which is gonna look like this, so it's a net area, we're gonna wind up getting our two thirds, which checks our work from before. 